Welcome to Wichita Liberty TV with Bob Weeks. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Wichita, Kansas government and public policy. We're broadcast on KGPT Channel 26.1, also its companion website, kgpt26.com. Some of you may know me from my blog, that's the Voice for Liberty on the internet at wichitaliberty.org. There, the motto is Individual Liberty, Limited Government, and Free Markets in Wichita and Kansas. I cover things that may not be covered by the Wichita Eagle or other TV stations or radio. Or if we do cover the same news, I'll do it from the perspective of economic freedom, limited government, and individual liberty, as these are the things that are important, and these are the things we find so often under attack by our government, be it at the federal, state, or local level. So please, visit wichitaliberty.org. You can subscribe to the email newsletter I send two or three times a week. And if you want to contact me, you'll find my email address and telephone number there. Or just remember, bob.weeks at gmail.com. A few weeks ago, earlier in March, the Kansas Supreme Court handed down the decision in Gannon v. Kansas, or what we know as the Kansas School Finance Lawsuit. This is a decision that was eagerly awaited by pretty much everyone in Kansas, I would say, because what the court said would likely have a big impact on what the Kansas legislature had to do this year. And after the court ruled, well, both sides claimed at least a partial victory. The actual court opinion says, affirmed in part, reversed in part, and remanded with directions. And the Wichita Eagle headline on the Sunday after the decision read, Kansas Supreme Court School Finance Ruling Seen by Many as Win for Both Sides. Now, Democrats and maybe moderate Republicans emphasize this passage from the press release that accompanied the decision. The court concluded the state had established unconstitutional funding disparities among districts. Estimates by Democrats in the Kansas State Department of Education is that the cost is $129 million to correct this inequity that the court found. Now, some Republicans have disputed that, saying that the court mentioned no specific dollar amount. But the governor has said that this is the amount that the legislature needs to find. Well, the court's decision also clarified that the Kansas Constitution contains at least two separate components for public education. There's adequacy, and then there's also equity. The adequacy requirement is met when the structure and implementation of the state's public education financing system is reasonably calculated. Well, there's a term of legal art. Reasonably calculated to have all students meet or exceed certain minimum educational standards. The court also said that the lower court's test for inadequacy was incorrect because it exclusively focused on cost studies. Therefore, the court reversed and remanded the adequacy issue to the panel so it can apply the proper test and make appropriate findings. This, I think, is a pretty big deal, that the court delineated a difference between adequacy and equity. Equity, of course, refers to whether the different school districts around the state are being treated fairly. We have in Kansas, as I think most states have, school districts with widely varying levels of wealth. And the concern is that students that attend schools in wealthy districts are getting a better education than those that are attending schools in poor districts. The way equity works is that wealthier parts of the state will send money to poorer parts of the state, and hopefully the students there will then get a better education. We call this equalization in Kansas. Adequacy, however, refers to whether students are getting a good education or not. Well, the court's opinion also holds this interesting language. It says, total spending is not the touchstone for determining adequacy. And regarding spending, the court said that all funding sources will now be included, including grant funds, federal funds, CAPER state contributions, etc. Well, CAPERS, you know, the Kansas Public Employee Retirement System, that's the state retirement fund for teachers and other government employees. Some people, those in favor of more school spending, they believe that the state's contribution to the teacher retirement funds should not be considered part of school spending. Now, in analyzing the Kansas school funding lawsuit ruling, one national education expert wrote, instead of deciding whether or not the Kansas legislature had dedicated sufficient funds to its local schools, it chose to highlight the importance of student outcomes. 
Well, this shifting of focus to student outcomes, I think, like I said, it's a pretty big deal. So much attention has been focused solely on spending, that is, the level of spending in schools. And there's a reason for that. Here's something from John Stossel. He said, Education reformers have a name for the resistance, the resistance to school reform he's talking about. He calls it the education blob. The blob includes the teachers' unions, but also janitors and principals' unions, school boards, PTA bureaucrats, local politicians, and so on. The blob that Stoschel refers to is the education bureaucracy, the education establishment that thrives on school spending, and thriving it does without regard to whether the spending is necessary, efficient, or fruitful. The blob also vigorously opposes reforms to education. In Kansas, the blob re opposes reforms that are popular and creative in other states. Right now in Kansas, we're seeing the blob on full alert, vigorously working to protect its interest. And the source of the blob's consternation is a bill in the Kansas legislature that would add charter schools and tax credit scholarships to the educational landscape in Kansas. Well, Kansas does have charter schools at present, but the law is so stacked in favor of the blob's interest that there are very few charter schools in Kansas. That's because in Kansas, charter schools must be approved by the local school district. And local school districts, they generally don't want competition from charter schools or any other schools for that matter. It's kind of like asking McDonald's to get permission for Burger King to open across the street. Now, the bill that's floating around the Kansas legislature this week is an attempt to introduce some needed educational reforms in Kansas in response to increasing school funding in response to the court's decision regarding equity. And the blob doesn't like, it, uh, like reform, not at all. And an example of a prominent spokesperson for the blob is the Wichita Eagles' Rhonda Holman. She recently wrote that Kansans want more school funding. She wrote... In the Kansas Speaks survey released last fall by the Docking Institute of Public Affairs at Fort Hay State University, two-thirds said they wanted to see more K-12 state funding. Now, I don't doubt that these results are accurate. The desire for good schools is nearly universal. There's really no surprise there. But when we look at the beliefs of people, we find that they are largely uninformed and misinformed about the level of school spending. The Kansas Policy Institute commissioned a survey that asked the public a series of questions on schools and spending. And a key finding is that most people think that schools spend much less than actual spending and by a large margin. Further, most people think spending has declined when in fact it has risen. These findings are similar to other research commissioned by Kansas Policy Institute, and surveys by other organizations at the national level have produced the same results. That is, people are simply uninformed about school spending. Now, not surprisingly, when citizens and taxpayers learn the true level of school spending, their attitude towards school spending changes. They're less likely to support increased taxes and spending, and that's dangerous to school spending advocates, the blob. It diminishes their most compelling arguments for more school spending. Now, the Wichita Eagle editorial board, along with the Kansas City Star, has been instrumental in misinforming Kansas about school spending. These two newspapers, it's, now it's their editorial boards I'm speaking of, are not doing favors for either taxpayers, parents, or students. These newspapers continually use base state aid per pupil as the measure of school spending, when in fact this is just a fraction of total spending on schools. For example, total state aid per pupil this past school year was $6,984, while base state aid per pupil was $3,838. Total state spending, therefore, was 1.82 times of base state aid, or nearly twice as much as the figure that is usually bannered around. Then, schools receive additional funds from federal and local sources. So it's important to consider the totality of spending and not just base state aid per people. It's important because total spending is so much greater than base state aid. And also, total spending accounts for some of the difficulties and expenses that schools cite when asking for higher spending. For example, the blob, the education bureaucracy, they point to non-English speaking students and at-risk students as being expensive to educate. 
And in recognition of this, the Kansas School Finance Formula makes allowances for this through weightings. For each bilingual student a school district has, an additional 39.5% over base state aid is given to the district. And for at-risk pupils, the weighting is 45.6%. What are at-risk students, you might be asking? Well, according to the Kansas Legislative Briefing Book, at-risk students are determined on the basis of at-risk factors determined by the School District Board of Education and not by virtue of eligibility for free meals. Well, taken together, bilingual students considered to also be at risk can generate an additional 85.1% of Bay State aid to be sent to the school district for each student. Now, the survey that Rhonda Holman of the Wichita Eagle Editorial Board relies upon as evidence of the desire for more school spending did not ask, as far as I know, questions to see if respondents were informed on the issue. And as we found, people are just not very well informed. So when you ask someone if they'd like more spending on schools, well, who can say no to that? It's all about the kids, don't you know? But this may be changing. As the Kansas Supreme Court said, all spending must be taken into account, not just pay state aid, which, as we've seen, is just a fraction of total spending. But here's what's really bad about the Wichita Eagle and Kansas City Star editorial boards. Instead of seeking to educate their readers on the facts, they resort to demagoguery and demonizing. Holman referred to education reforms coveted by some conservatives and the American Legislative Exchange Council. Well, there we have it, the two evils, conservatives and ALEC, these being pretty much the entire substance of her argument. Well, the two reforms being talked about in Kansas that are popular in other states are popular except with the blob, that is. And one of these form reforms is a tax credit scholarship program. This lets corporations make contributions to organizations that would then provide scholarships for students to attend private schools. The corporations would then receive credits against their income tax liabilities. Now, the blob opposes programs like this. The blob says that these programs simply let students that are already in private or church schools have the state pay their tuition. But the proposed law in Kansas this year, just as it has been in years past, contains these provisions. For the scholarship program, students must qualify as at-risk students and be attending a school that qualifies as Title I. Well, that's a program that applies to students with or schools with many students from low-income families. Further, the student must have been enrolled in a public school before seeking a scholarship unless the student is less than six years old. So together, these two requirements rebut the argument of the blob, that the tax credit scholarships are just a way for children already in private or church schools to get tax funds to pay for their schools. Instead, the law targets these scholarships at students from low-income households and students that are not already in private schools. Another possible reform is charter schools. These are schools that are public schools and receive public funding, but operate outside the present education establishment and local school boards. Now, the blob objects to this because they say that without government oversight, charter schools are not held accountable. The blob must forget that charter schools are accountable to the parents of children, and that's a higher standard than being held accountable by government bureaucrats. Also, unlike the regular public schools, the government cannot force children to attend a charter school. If parents think a charter school is not doing a good job, well, they send their students somewhere else, which might be a different charter school or maybe back to the regular public schools. Now, the blob also criticizes charter schools because they say charter schools cherry-pick the best students, leaving public schools with the worst, the leftovers, they say. But here's what the proposed Kansas law says. A public charter school shall enroll all students who wish to attend the school. And if more students apply than the school has space for, students will be selected via lottery. And in most areas that have charter schools, there are many more aspirants than available spaces, and students are chosen by lottery. This would undoubtedly be the case in Kansas. Well, the blob also says that charter schools pick only the students they want, and therefore this leads to segregation. But here's something from the proposed law. 
A public charter school shall be subject to all federal and state laws prohibiting discrimination on the basis of disability, race, creed, color, gender, national origin, religion, ancestry, or need for special education services. Now, here's what the blob really hates about charter schools. The law says a public charter school shall be exempt from all laws and rules and regulations that are otherwise applicable to public schools in the state. And also this, teachers in public school, charter schools shall be exempt from the teacher certification requirements established by the state board. You see, the blob values its rules and regulations that create work for its fleets of bureaucrats. Never mind that these regulations probably don't increase student learning. That's really not the point. And the political muscle of the blobs, the teachers union. Well, charter school teachers usually are not unionized. And we find that teachers unions are in favor of public schools only if the teachers are in unions. Now, the Kansas blob is proud of Kansas schools partly because of scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, also known as the nation's report card. And Kansas does rank pretty high amongst the states on this test. It's important, however, to examine the results from a few different angles to make sure we understand the entire situation. Now, data for the 2013 administration of the test was released last fall, and I've gathered scores and made them available in an interactive visualization that you can use on the internet at wichitaliberty.org. The most widely available NAEP data is for two subjects, reading and math, and for two grades, four and eight. This video that I'm going to show you that I made presents data for Kansas, Texas, and the average for national public schools. I choose to compare Kansas with Texas because for several reasons Kansas has been comparing itself with Texas. So let's look at these test scores and see if the reality matches with what Kansas school leaders, the blob, are telling us. I'm Bob Weeks. Kansas school leaders are proud of Kansas schools, partly because of scores on the National Assessment of Educational Progress Test, or NAEP. Kansas ranks pretty high among the states on this test. NAEP is a test that's controlled by the federal government and is the same in all states. Data for the 2013 administration of the test was just released. I've gathered scores and made them available in a visualization that you can use at wichitaliberty.org. The most widely available NAEP data is for two subjects, reading and math, and for two grades, four and eight. Here's data for Kansas, Texas, and the average for national public schools. I choose to compare Kansas with Texas because for several reasons, Kansas has been comparing itself with Texas. So let's look at these test scores and see if the reality matches what Kansas school leaders have said. This is the data for the past five administrations of NAEP. Looking at this with Kansas in blue, Texas in green, and national public schools in yellow, you can see why Kansas school leaders are proud of Kansas. The blue line representing Kansas is almost always the highest. NAEP also makes data available by ethnic subtypes. Here's the same chart, but this time showing black students only. Do you see something different? Now Texas is higher than Kansas in all cases but one where there is a tie. Here's the same chart again, but showing Hispanic students only. Texas is higher in some cases, and Kansas and Texas are virtually tied in two others. Note that National Public Schools is higher than Kansas in some cases. Finally, here's the same chart, but showing white students only. Texas is higher than Kansas in three or four cases, and in some cases the National Public School average beats or ties Kansas. So we have what seems to be four contradictory statements, but each in fact is true. That is, when considering all students, Kansas scores higher than Texas. When looking at Hispanic students only, Kansas is roughly equal to Texas. Looking at black students only, Kansas is scores less than Texas. And when looking at white students only, Kansas scores less than Texas in most cases. How can this be? 
Well, the answer is something called Simpson's Paradox, which shows that aggregated data can appear to reverse important trends in the numbers being combined. In more detail, it's a paradox in which a trend that appears in different groups of data disappears when these groups are combined, and the reverse trend appears for the aggregate data. And many statisticians believe that the mainstream public should be informed of the counterintuitive results in statistics such as Simpson's Paradox. In this case, the confounding factor, or lurking variable, is that the two states differ greatly in the proportion of students in various ethnic groups. For example, in Kansas, about 69% of the students are white. In Texas, it's 33%. This large difference in the composition of students is what makes it look like Kansas students perform better on the NAEP test than Texas students. But looking at the scores for ethnic subgroups, which state would you say has the most desirable set of NAEP scores? It's important to know that aggregated data can mask or hide underlying trends. And here's a question I have for you. Have you heard Kansas school leaders talk about this? Or do they talk only about the aggregated data? So when we consider the data for all students, you can see why Kansas school leaders are proud. The line representing Kansas is almost always the highest. But if we present a chart showing black students only, something different appears. Now Texas test scores are higher than Kansas in all cases except one where there is a tie. And as the video showed, similar trends appear when considering other subgroups. All of a sudden, the spectacular test scores that Kansas schools seem to have and that the blob promotes as evidence of the goodness of everything it does, well, it turns out to really be just an illusion. So when you hear the blob trumpet high test scores for Kansas schools, does it also explain these nuances that give us a better picture of Kansas schools? Well, no, they don't do that. And by the way, Texas spends quite a bit less on its schools on a per student basis, of course, than we do in Kansas. Now, another problem you won't hear about from the blob. Kansas has low standards for its schools, and even worse, at a time when Kansas was spending more on schools due to an order from the Kansas Supreme Court after the last school finance lawsuit, the state lowered some of its already low standards for schools. Now, it's not me that says this. This is the conclusion of the National Center for Education Statistics based on the most recent version of a program called Mapping State Proficiency Standards onto the NAEP Scales. Now, NCES is the primary federal entity for collecting and analyzing data related to education in the United States and other nations. It's located within the United States Department of Education. Now, the mapping project establishes a relationship between the test each state gives to its students and the National Assessment of Educational Progress, NAEP, as we've been talking about, which is a test that is the same in all states and not under the control of the blob in each state. Now, the key point for Kansas is that our standards are low when compared to other states. And after the last school finance decision, the state lowered some of its standards. Now, these standards don't have anything to do with the level of school spending, but it's a reflection of the attitudes of the education blob. And from things like what I showed you today, we learned that our state's educational establishment is not being honest and forthright with us. Now, we've talked about the public, school, public Choice School of Economics and Political Science in past episodes. We found that that teaches us that government, and, government bureaucrats and politicians have self-interest just like the rest of us. And one way that bureaucrats, well, that's the education blob, remember, one way that they satisfy its self-interest is through larger budgets and more power. So the desire of the blob for more school spending and less competition from things like charter schools and private schools well, that's just human nature. But our state's newspapers don't have this motivation. They don't have this excuse. Our state's newspapers and their editorial boards should be focused on the truth and what is in the best interest of Kansas school children, not what is in the best interest of the blob. And I'm sorry to have to tell you that our newspapers and most other news media are failing to advance and protect the interests of Kansas school children.